So basically, first of all, the title. I would like to thank Ms. Ms. Constantin that she corrected me that it's not only the rule of law mechanism, but it's the rule of law conditionality mechanism, which was a brand new thing last year that was activated. Just to start the discussion, I would like to introduce the panelists. First of all, I would start with Simone Constantin, who is the deputy head of cabinet of Vera Europa, vice president of the European Commission. And then Gwendolyn Dalbos Corfield, who is not only a member of the European Parliament from the Green Party, but also, among other important duties, the Rapporteur for Hungary. She was responsible for the interim report last year. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Peter Hale, who is the Policy Director of Democratic Coalition Party within the European Parliament. So I'm delighted to have all of you here, because I think that you are all very knowledgeable about the situation. And I also think that, that the rule of law issue has become a bit more important than the case of Hungary because it has political uh, implications, also because of the veto right and also because of the geopolitical situation that we have been living lately because of the Ukraine war. So I think it's, it's very important to discuss about this issue and how the rule of law conditionality mechanism can handle this problem. So first of all, a little bit of background information I would like to ask in the first round. And I would like to turn to Ms. Konstantin to ask about the past two years period because this rule of law conditionality mechanism entered into force over two years ago and it has been triggered last year. I would like to ask from your perspective how this process went on, how did you see this, and on behalf of the Commission, what was your role in this whole process to you? And you have the microphone next to you. Thank you very much, Esther, for the invitation, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to see that, you know, it's, it's a Saturday, but <laughs> there are some of us really interested in having such debates, and I hope, you know, this is something that will continue and maybe spread around the society at a larger scale because we really need to promote the need to defend the rule of law. Now, maybe to, you know, directly address your, your question, I would say all this period has been a bit like a, a roller coaster <laughs> because, you know, immediately after it, the regulation entered into force, we had very, very strong calls that the next day we would already open the first case. So a lot of, you know, emotions and, and pressure. Then there were periods where maybe it wasn't that much visibility for the instrument, but I can tell you that there was super intensive work in the commission to actually build the first case to trigger the regulation. Then we had the moment when, okay, we took the, f the first formal steps under the regulation, you know, first with a political letter to Hungary. Then we had a time when, you know, Hungary engaged and they came with all the commitments last year over the summer. So we thought, okay, they will deliver on what they have committed. There was super intensive work during the summer. But then, you know, we got to autumn and we realized that, no, they haven't fulfilled everything, huh? so we had to go on with the, with the case. So that's why I'm saying that it was a bit like a roller coaster because you had this, you know, ups, ups and downs. Huh? Now, well, we are at a moment when we have the first council decision under the mechanism, and very soon we will see whether Hungary will fully deliver on the remedial measures or not. They have an obligation to report by 16 March, and then under the regulation, you know, there's a regular reporting obligation every three months. And yeah, I think we hope that we will see Hungary delivering because if we have tools and, you know, we use them, I think we all want to use them because there are certain objectives. We want to correct things. I don't think, you know, anybody wants to stay with rule of law problems, but it's, it's difficult to say at this moment what will happen. Maybe on what was our role, I go now to your description of the event, you know, the question whether this is the sharpest tool in the rule of law toolbox. I think it would be a bit strange if I would just say it's the sharpest tool, because in a way it's not even per se a rule of law tool. I mean, it's a budget protection tool. 
When we started with the proposal from the Commission, it was a bit of a different approach. It was a true, you know, rule of law, defense mechanism. What we have now in terms of legislation, it is a legislation to protect the budget in cases when, you know, there are breaches of, of the rule of law. So whether it's the sharpest tool, I would not say so. I think it, it's a great tool, but it has to work together with the others. I don't think, you know, it can deliver the best results just on its own, and maybe I will explain during the, the, the debate. Of course, if you look at the specific case of Hungary and the other, you know, the proper rule of law tools we have, Article 7, infringements, even the European semester with recommendations, of course, the most effective reaction from Hungary we have seen under this tool, under the budget conditionality, right? Because the issues we identified here, I mean, they have been known and, you know, they have been appearing under various instruments for years and years. We haven't seen much move from Hungary. So, yes, their reaction, the biggest reaction, it's under this tool. But I think it will remain, you know, we can debate whether we can <clears throat> credit this reaction just to the mechanism as such, or, you know, we should also look at, for example, should Hungary have been in a different economic situation than the one that they are today? Would, he, would they have responded the same, with the same commitments, or if they wouldn't have had, you know, so much financial economic pressure? You know, question to be debated. The last point for the introduction on what was our role so since it is a, a budget protection tool, you know that the main lead is with the budget world in the Commission. We have had Commissioner Han, who has done, I would say, a work by the book on, on this tool, you know, really documenting the case and going one by one, fully engaging with Hungary, but also being clear on what is, is not done. Of course, it was also a, a teamwork and the rule of law you know, team in the commission, my VP, commissioner Reinders, they were fully involved. And then even broader involvement because all these links with the um, recovery and resilience plan, with the cohesion money, you know, the enabling horizontal conditionality. So I would say, you know, the entire commission was, you know, regularly updated and taking decisions and, and fully behind uh, everything. Thank you for this comprehensive overview of the Commission's role in this. And now I would turn to Ms. Sebo Scorfield. You have a microphone here. Because uh, you were the rapporteur last year who you prepared the interim report and you even made a trip, you visited Hungary last year. I wanted to ask you, obviously you had a lot of previous knowledge and also a bit related to that process, what has been going on. What were your experiences during your visit and were there any big surprises or was it according to your expectations? Or if you could also give us an overview how this process of this rule of law conditionality mechanism has been evolved I got involved in, in the Hungarian file nearly immediately when I was elected. It's my first term, so uh, in, in July 2019, because it was a file that was uh, nearly immediately appointed, because, of course, it came from the, the triggering of the Article 7, the report of Judy Sardonsini in 2018. And so in some of the first discussions the Libe coordinators, the coordinators of the, the Libe committee had, at the very beginning of the term, they took the decision immediately They would appoint a sort of a standing reporter for Hungary, which, I mean, it doesn't exist anyway. It was, uh, it's a decision they took because, indeed, there was a big disappointment of the parliament that nothing had happened after the vote with a difficult majority. I mean, and you, everyone has to remember that until the end, Judith herself, but the others in the other groups that were also very involved in, in, in this report, they were not sure it would be voted, the triggering of the Article 7. And when I arrived in Parliament, people would even say, if it was now, it would not be voted again, which in fact was not true. But there was this feeling that it was a very difficult thing to achieve to get this report voted, and then Council didn't do anything with it, and so we needed Parliament to go back to the fight and to have a, a standing rapporteur because nothing was happening, and, and we could not just say, okay, we've we triggered Article 7, but now our job is finished. 
I already knew the situation because I was for two terms in the executive committee of the Green European Greens before becoming a member of parliament and the very, uh, I don't know, uh, American with suspense story of the Hungarian Greens has um, always made us very busy for years. So I knew very well how difficult, uh, two things, how difficult it was to be a left opposition party in, in Hungary. And, and we knew also, of course, the topics of debates, the migration, the LGBTI. Already I knew all of this before I came to the parliament. And then uh, very quickly the pandemic arrived. I was already fully working on it, reading everything, knowing everything. But the pandemic was really a moment of, of increased involvement because you in Hungary, you became really frightened in about what was going to happen. In, in a few days you were in this emergency state. There was a bit of a big worry, concern, of how would it go? And so I started in March 2020 to have every week meetings with 10 to 12 NGOs from Brussels and Budapest filling me in week after week during this pandemic on remote, on Zoom, uh, like all, all we all did at the time, to feed me until June when we could travel again. And I think it was very important for them because it was a, a place where to have support, a place to be listened to. And knowing that also I could bring back the info at, at the time, I also did Zoom with Vera Jourova, Didier Reinders, the Secretary of State on Europe at the time, that was Amélie Monchalin, very involved also. I mean, I also had Germans on the phone, so it was a way of... so. And then, so all of that to say that when I went... And then that went on after the pandemic. It was not once a week, but we did this every month meeting with more and more NGOs involved. And I had an in-depth knowledge of nearly everything when I went on the official mission. So for me, it wasn't really a shock. What you have to understand, it was very important for my shadows because you can know because it's one of your files, you've got 50 files, it's one of your files, you've got the Hungarian file, you are very involved MEP, but it's still one of your files, you know a bit theoretically, but to go there makes a lot. It was very impressive, I think, also on one of my... Um, Shadow, Swedish leftist, Malin Björk, because she was constantly attacked when she was in Hungary, being LGBTI. I mean, a dress in Brussels was given in a newspaper. We were very violently aggressed, not in physically, but in words, by a taxi driver that understood who we were. And so, yes, that was the big awareness. And I think that what we came back with the most is the panel that impressed us the most at the time was the panel of the journalists. Because when we went for the official mission, one new thing had come in. It was the Pegasus scandal. And I remember very well one of the journalists we had who was presented himself saying, I've always been one of the less critics. Not that I'm not a, a very critic of the Fidesz government, but I hate when my, colleague, my colleagues would do shortcuts and say, we live in a Russian authoritarian world and all of this, I don't agree, we should be nuanced and all of this. And he said, that's what I would have told you one month ago. But Pegasus arrived and now I'm thinking, am I living also now in a Russian sort of atmosphere as a journalist in Hungary? So that's what we came back. I think the most affected by was the Pegasus, how Pegasus has dramatically changed things. People, activists, NGOs, journalists, politicists, thinking also that I, they are still so surveilled. I just want at this point to add that since then we've realized that in a number of other countries of European Union, you also have people surveilled. So the first shock was in Hungary. But in fact, journalists and activists have problems in other uh, countries of European Union. So that's for the vision of the situation. I did a trip on my, my own. I did a personal mission on the three days around the last elections. I went in my APA. I went out of Budapest this time to travel a bit. I didn't tell it to everyone because I didn't want to be accused of interfering on the elections or, or anything of this. And I went back on, in Budapest only on the Sunday when you were voting to have a look. I went to a few um, voting places to see how it was happening. And that's when I came back with a knowledge that I didn't have before when I spoke in the countryside 
with people is the disinformation effect. I was very, very amazed by the fact that people really believed that the European Union would send young uh, Hungarians to war in Ukraine, physically send them in the weeks or, or the two weeks coming. I, I, it, it was sort of amazing to, di to discuss this with people. And then, of course, this incredibly stupid thing. You had the referendum at the same time as the election, the LGBTI referendum. This incredibly, incredibly stupid thing about European Union wanting to propose to children of three and five to change sex systematically in every school. And this level of, and I remember this taxi driver telling me, and I said, I mean, how can you even imagine this? This is not our job, this is not what we do. It's, and, he was, and, you know, and he said, yeah, of course you would say that that's not your plan, but this is your plan, secret plan. And then you come to a stage when you think, how can you answer this? There's a moment where you just don't, you, and, and we've seen that in America. It's just, you know, people are starting to believe the earth is not round Im anymore. And I think this is one of the most desperate things about Hungary today. In, in 10 years, a decade of disinformation by Viktor Orban himself, what it has managed to do. To finish on the sharpest, is it the sharpest tool or not? First thing is that it's a money tool. I really want to stress this. I was very shocked in the first month I had the report because I had the feeling, in the Greens in particular, in my own group, but in We Knew also, that there was this belief that this would be the miracle tool. So once you would have this conditionality, it would be so easy. Immediately everything would disappear. Sort of, I thought that was really amazing. It is a money tool. And the way that it was designed, because also it's not as ambitious as the first proposal coming from the parliament years ago, then the commission took it itself, is a tool that was created in a big moment of blackmailing by Orban on the general budget of uh, the European Union, you must not forget that. So what it ended at, at the very end, and remember that we even thought it would never exist. And... The Germans and the French did, and they were very proud about it, did manage to get something in the end, but it's tiny. It's on not a lot of money, and it has to be very clearly linked to the misuse. It means that you have to prove that Europe and money has been misused. It's not about if the country has got good rule of law or not good rule of law. You could have a country with not good rule of law, but that doesn't misuse the Europe and money, and then, so I really want to say this again, and also you were saying, was this if the situation was not as desperate in Hungary, but also don't forget that some countries are net givers to the European Union. So if tomorrow Rassemblement National comes to the power in France, do they need European money? And then is it efficient? So it's not a miraculous tool, and what I always say is that it's one tool complementary to the others. And what we have not been efficient doing in this last decade concerning Hungary has been to activate timely every tool that we had when we had it. That's what we need to do. You cannot win this conflict, like any conflict, with one solution. You, you, you win it using every tool. It's complementary to inf infringement procedures from the Commission. I think that the former Commission was too late in a number of infringement procedures against Hungary on the judicial point of view, others. So it's a bit too late, but there's infringement procedures. And now that we have a certain numbers that have been activated by the Commission, we see that you can at least hold a bit things. There's, of course, the Article 7 process. And Article 7 process is not only important because it has a very important symbolic effect. But I'm very sure that we would not be able today to have a good case of conditionality mechanism on Hungary if we were not in the Article 7 procedure, because that is basically one of the first base of the legitimacy. There's a first report, then a second report from the parliament that has been voted with majority, but there's a number also of Venice Commission and all of these reports that are saying we have a rule of law problem. But then, you know, the, so imagine tomorrow the commission wanting to go against Greece or, or another country. I'm taking Greece because it's one of my big concerns at the moment. But it will be much more difficult because there's a, a sort of a general 
acknowledgement that the situation is really bad in Hungary. So it was easier, I would say, to the Commission, even if they went thoroughly out of it, to have a legal case. But it was... And just to finish, there's another tool that the Commission, I think, didn't use well. And this is something that we really go after, and I think we should be careful for next year. I, and, but this is not in DG, in values and justice, this is in cohesion fund itself. I have difficulties to understand why some programs were not stopped before by the Commission, because OLAF and others have been documented how bad the money was taken out and never went to the places. And that's why at one moment, I think today, Commission has to be sometimes more proactive, but we have to give them legitimacy to do it in Cohesion Fund to say, look, I think we should stop this program because it's not going how it should be going. And in Hungary's situation, we knew it for years and we would have had less the possibility of enriching Orban and his oligarchy that is really... It's because of European money that he installed part of his autocracy because he had the means to do it. Thank you so much for this overview. And now I would like to turn to Peter Hale, who is the policy director of one, actually the biggest opposition party in the European Parliament. Can you please give us an insight how you live through in the past two years, I know it's, it's difficult and it might be also a roller coaster, but just to give us your perspective, how you experienced it within the European Parliament representing an opposition party from Hungary. Well, actually, I've spent the last five years here in Brussels and practically my first day at work in the European Parliament was the day when the Sargent TV report was adopted in Strasbourg. It has been, of course, with us ever since. I think the glass is half full rather than half empty. After so many years of seemingly ineffective talk, we are now in a situation where the Commission and the Council have both clearly taken decisions. I should have started with the Devil's Corfield report because that's an excellent piece of work. I really have to say that also publicly, if you want to understand what's going on into Hungary, that is your source. So the parliament very clearly said what it wanted. And then after, yes, as you say, a roller coaster, and I would quietly say probably two years too late, because it all should have happened on the 1st of January 2021. But at least the commission, and after that also the council, took very, very important decisions. Now, to the question whether the rule of law conditionality mechanism is the sharpest tool in the box, technically speaking, factually, certainly it is not. And in the current situation, what you are seeing is not so much the effect of the rule of law conditionality mechanism, but we are actually, Orban is, is cornered because of the RRF regulation, because of the semester because that was the tool that the Commission has decided to put on the table the issue of the independence of justice. I come from the structural funds world, and I couldn't agree more with, with the last statement of Madame Corfield, saying that I never understood why the Commission hasn't invoked the Common Provisions Regulation, which since 2014 as they the respect of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I never understood why the Commission has simply accepted or was seemingly accepting the funds management system of the Orban government for years and years and years, especially at the turn of a budgetary cycle. They should have said in my book, sorry guys, as long as you don't have an independent justice system, all of your audits and financial controls are worth nothing, and you, you will not get a single euro. And at the end of the day, the funny thing is that on the 22nd of December last year, this, this has actually happened. I think now we can say, and I really don't want to be insatiable, that both the Commission and Parliament and Council have taken sides. The problem why it's only a glass half full is that even if all the 27 plus 3 conditions will be fulfilled by the Orban government, which they will not be. But even if they were, Hungary would not return to a democracy. We have nothing in this process 
about the freedom of the media. We have nothing in this process about the election laws. We have very little about the freedom of civil society. We have very important things there, and I do believe that if Orban is forced to restore at least some of the independence of the justice system, and if there is a little more transparency about where the money actually goes, we will, be, we will have changed things. And Orban will have to face at least a minimum of, ac of accountability back at home. But of course, we will not yet get the actual, the only instrument that would that desperately need to work. And it's, it has been, hasn't been working for five years, and it has produced exactly zero results. That's the Article 7 process. The reason the Article 7 process has not delivered results is the 70-year-old tradition of the European Union to always try to accommodate each other. And that's a very important tradition. It's a noble tradition in, a, in, the, in the sense that it is based on the mutual trust between member states, that they will stick to the rules, that they will be honest with each other, that they will be after the common good. And the problem with Orban is not that he is unable or unwilling to set up uh, an audit system that prevents corruption. The problem with Orban is that he is outside this consensus. He is an enemy of the European Union because it is the only thing left that is still somehow a limit to his power. And he is not an administrative problem. He is not a legal problem. He is a political problem. And I just quietly hope that the decisions that were taken at the end of last year may be the sign of the realization of not just by Parliament, because Parliament always understood from the first moment, but also from Council and maybe even from the Commission that you are in a political fight. And you are not fighting for Hungary, you are fighting for the European Union, for the integrity of the entire enterprise. It's not today to discuss maybe all the ways in which the Orban government is undermining and threatening the very core of the European Union, but it is an, an existential fight. It is a generational fight that the Union somehow has to win. Now, assessing the current situation, I would like to ask you, this tool triggered a debate because of a scandal in Hungary because of the Erasmus and the Horizon program, because it was something tangible for the people that they understood that there are consequences of freezing the funds. And now, just this week, the government decided to withdraw the ministers from these public trust funds that they turned the, public, the state universities into. And this made me think, well, this is a kind of a symbolic decision. This made me think how the assessment will be of this criteria, what Peter just mentioned. So these 27 super milestones and legislation, legislative changes and setting up the integrity authority. So they are trying to do something at the moment, apparently. But how will the Commission assess these measures and their applications? I think I, I said it before, I can only expect that everything will be really assessed by the book and one by one. And I think, you know, we clearly show this with the, the assessment we have done, as I said, uh, in, in autumn. Now, maybe with the, the Erasmus and, 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 and Horizon, <sighs> look, it's, you know, it, it is a budgetary tool. It is about protecting the budget. And if the EU budget is given with certain objectives, I think all of us in our, you know, not institutional roles, beyond the institutional roles, just as, as citizens from everywhere expect that it will be used for those purposes. So if you have a risk to the budget, then you have a risk to the budget. It's a bit like, you know, some situations are clear. They are either black or white. You cannot be half pregnant. <laughs> Sorry to use this example, but it's either you have a risk to the budget or you don't have. If there is the risk, then... Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, we have to address it everywhere. And, but this was something known. I mean, the, the issue of the public interest trusts, it's, it's not now. Uh, it was flagged also by the European Commission since it appeared. It was everywhere. It's clearly in the Council decision of, of December. So 
I, I don't think it was a surprise for the uh, Hungarian government, and I truly hope that, as they have stated, they indeed in then intend to correct the, the situation because for now there aren't you know, consequences on the ground because the current programs, they continue. But if this is not corrected, indeed it will affect the possibility to continue with such, such programs. Huh? So we will see you know, what Hungary reports back on, on these measures. But there are intense, you know, there is intense work and, and discussions, of course, with the, with the commission uh, services to ensure that what is delivered meets, you know, the remedial measures and, and the expectations. I can't say now, you know, it will be good how it will be assessed or, or not. I can only tell you it will really be assessed with a view to be able to say, is there still a risk? Yes or no? That's the idea behind. I know... It's a bit uh, difficult because, you know, you are talking about rhetorics and, and disinformation and uh, it's probably a bit difficult to communicate this issue of the, you know, the Erasmus, the, the researchers, because also, you know, this is a bit at the soul of our European uh, work for a long time, these exchanges, but it has to be clearly explained why this measure, huh? I mean, the, the way that these public interest trusts are designed it is an issue. It's a big issue in terms of really ensuring that the money will be given to the right objectives, you know, without conflict of interest, so on and, and, and so forth. So I truly hope that this, you know, the Hungarian government will, will look at this seriously and, and yeah, they will remedy the, the situation. There were positive uh, signals in this regard from, from the respective ministers, and I think we, we look forward to see that happening. Thank you. I really liked your um, inventory of possibilities to, to step up for the rule of law, and I, I guess you are following still closely what's happening in Hungary, and you saw the latest billboard campaigns as well, the, the EU sanctions will destroy us with this text, and there was this 97% of Hungarians are against EU sanctions, and what came to my mind, would it be possible to, to step up for consumer protection, because it's, it says government information, and it's basically a lie. There is an EU regulation that protects consumers from fake advertisement. And what, what is your take about that? Yeah, of course I think it would be possible. I think tools are tools. Legal structures and rules are legal structures and rules that you have to comply with, of course. But you can always not use a tool even, even if you've got it just next to you. You can decide that you're going to try to cut your apple with your own hands and leave the knife here if you want to. You can have the sharpest knife and just decide to leave it on the side. And I think that rule of law is specifically a topic where for a long time European Union just didn't want to use its tool, its legal structures, what was in the treaty, what exists, what... And at one moment, I, I think we've, we've went out of this phase, but I even had the feeling one year ago that we were inventing... We wanted to invent every month a new thing that would be the miraculous tool, because indeed the conditionality was not satisfying. So people were starting... But we do have things that you just need to use. And so there's three important words, I would think. I would say it's awareness. You mustn't neglect that. The problem of awareness. The, the, the example that I know the most, of course, because even if I was not there, I know all the stories, is the parliament. Even in the parliament, in EPP, there was a real problem of awareness. They were the ones that didn't want to know, but they were the ones that are, were honestly annoyed with the situation. And some of them are the courageous ones that started to speak up. Petri Sarvama, this Finnish MEP, can explain to you very well as how Orban was a friend and how for him Orban was the liberal guy that would bring democracy. And it really took him awareness and he got aware much, much earlier than some of his. But he, he still t can tell you, I feel guilty that it took me two years to, because at the beginning I would not, and talking about it earlier, I mean, I always say, in 2011, the Tavares report of the parliament says it's a constitutional coup 
what we are seeing is, is huge. It's not little. And before the Sargentini report, between Tavares and Sargentini in A18, I mean, it's not only Greens. It's Lopez Aguilar from the Social Democrats. I mean, you have two other reports in these years. Not as strong, because they were on more topical things, but every episode that what happened in Hungary was flagged by the parliament. And if the parliament, and if the coordinators of Libe in 2000 17, at the end of 2017, decided Sophie Invel, Judith, Robert Metzola, can't remember who was the one for Social Democrats, sorry, four ladies decided we will go for this report. And Metzola officially was not on board, but she did say, I will, I will manage to leave let you do this. It's because Commission and Council were not acting and Parliament was thinking, this is becoming so dangerous. We need to be, but there was a real risk. Would we get the majority in Parliament? You know, it's because the Commission was not triggering Article 7 and Council was not doing anything. And the same is coming back again and again. We always have in Parliament to go back to push. So we need awareness. We need, and I think in the in the leaders of government in council, the awareness took also a very long time. And what, why today do we really have awareness? It's because of Ukraine. The, the life of Hung Hungarian citizens, sorry to say, but a number of leaders of government don't really care. But when they started to understand that Orban was a real problem for the situation between Ukraine and Russia, that's when the Baltic countries and, and some of the Central East countries started thinking, this guy could even one day be against us. He could reverse against us. And that's when the guy becomes difficult and dangerous and you can start thinking, okay, now I need to do something. So awareness is one point. Political courage is another point, and, and that you will have the most wonderful legal tool on the paper, if you don't have people with political courage, you just don't activate it. And I often say this, I arrive in 2019 and I meet this, these, I always give this example, so some of you may, might have, might be bored about it, but I really, I meet these Finnish ladies, these Finnish ministers, okay, all women and young. No, Minister of Interior, Minister of Justice, First, uh, Premier Minister, uh, Prime Minister, and Minister of European Affairs. Four women. Finland is the third country, little country, not, you know, they say, okay, why? There was this Article 7 process triggered by the Parliament, and, and in the treaties it said that we should do hearings. Why did we never do the hearings? Why nothing happened? And they said, okay, we will do hearings. And the first time I spoke to these ladies, it was in July, to, I, I really, I, I had just been elected, and they told me, we're going to try to do it, but we don't even know if they're not, the other member states are not even going to prevent it. Agenda, which is a powerful tool that you should always use, and Hungary will have a presidency in not long. And they said, okay, if, you know, there's this famous thing, if you put it on the agenda, it obliges the others to go against so one of the things when you're a presidency and you really want to put something on the agenda in your six months is you don't debate what you put in the agenda. You put it on the agenda and you wait to see if the others, and that's what they did. They didn't put it to discussion because they would have put it to discussion. They would have felt that they had too many, but they did that and nobody really dared saying, are we having a hearing of Hungary? And that's the first time that the council took the painful process of hearing one of themselves. And it is a difficult thing because you have this feeling that it's mutual trust and you have this feeling that you have, you know, what will happen to me if I start being a problem for you? And, and this is how you open the culture of European Union. So, and then you have the, so political will and political courage. And then you have just using a tool. Just, you, you never, you imagine you have never used Knife, you have never used a knife, and you are presented the first time. It's sort of, okay, we, so we, we, we have it, so now we have to use it. And I think, and it's awful, and I always feel very bad when I say that with Hungarian people around me, but I think that Hungary has been a great lesson to prevent things from happening in other member states. And it will have helped a lot, European Union. I'm so pessimist about Hungary itself, and I'm so sad, but at least in your, 
in your pain, you can have this honor of having, but I really think so, because it's not only that we have used, because it created the culture. We had this idea, I think we all had this idea that it would not come back. In the European Union, countries came in, they became democratic six months before because we had asked them for years to close chapters, so oh, suddenly they were democratic, so they were there, they were democratic, and it would never go back. And then we discovered that, and you know, still in a country like France or Germany, in the old democracies, they cannot believe that one day it will happen to them. You know, I, ha I still have f French people telling me, yes, but it's because it's Hungary. It's the East, it's, it's Central Europe. They, they were not used to democracy, you know. They, they had all of these years of authoritarian and, and Soviet Union. I mean, it's terrible, they, they didn't know. But no, we've got 300 years of democracy, come on. You know, today, the state of the text in France, because of a number of things, pandemic, uh, terrorism and all of this, uh, texts have been changed in France. Tomorrow, Rassemblement National comes to France and we have a very bad situation because we've already got fails in our system. So there's this thing about we could not come back and it never happened. So there's the appropriation of the culture, the fact that we started using the tool we had. The commission is now doing this rule of law state of play every year. It's becoming more and more accurate, more and more good. Now they're even doing recommendation. When they started... They would always say in the commission, we cannot do recommendation. We would like to, but it's going to be very badly seen. And now, okay, Reinders is coming everywhere and saying, yeah, I'm putting recommendation. I'm telling the countries, that's what you should be doing. But this is very new. We have been doing it for budgetary measures and the state of your deficit and your structural money organization for years. And we killed Greece in, in a minute, but on rule of law, it took all of these years. So you have appropriation. And I think, to finish, one of the next steps, we also have new tools because of Hungary. The Media Freedom Act, and for the moment, the Commission, and Vera Jourova is sticking to difficult things. And we have a problem with the German publishers on, on this, really. I mean, they are fighting against transparency in such a bad way, and I'm, and I'm seeing the parliament coming, becoming weak on this. I'm very upset about it, because it's the first time that we have a real tool that could help on media pluralism. Because media pluralism, for the moment, is not... We have this big value that it is important, but in fact, we don't have that many texts rules that make you help media pluralism. So how do you get media pluralism back if Media Freedom Act, the democratic plan that will come out also of the Commission, all of this is because of Hungary. It has given us the keys for new things that could prevent in the next country. But then you will still need political will and courage, and this is something that I really think the Commission needs to step up, is but in the name of European Union, so it also needs to have the legitimacy of the others around, around it. Now, today, we cannot go on having lies being told about European Union in a country without reacting. I just don't get it. We've, we, we saw it with Brexit. The, they just said lies and we didn't react. And then we say, oh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, 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 this, this campaign was, was win, won on false arguments. Well. I don't see why now European Union didn't, two months ago, put billboards. That's what I always say. I don't see why we let Orban say what he says. At one moment, if European Union wants to exist, it has also to use this tool, stepping up, when it is attacked, saying, no, this is not true. And it's going to take time, of course, like everything. But this is the next, I think, hint that we should have to European Union Commission, Council, Parliament putting pressure on this to say, you know, now it's time for European Union to defend itself every time it's attacked, not only in China, not only in Russia, but also in its, in its own member state, because there's no reason for a member, a, a leader saying, you know, lies and blunt lies and not being contradicted. Thank you so much. And before I give the word to Peter, I want to ask you to prepare with questions because we will have time until half past. So I would like to give you also the opportunity. But to Peter, I would like to ask about our homework in Hungary because we expect a lot from the EU and obviously we are happy when the EU does something. But next year we are going to have the European elections and what... 
is even peculiar in Hungary that European elections will be organized on the same day with municipal elections. And DECA is the leading force of the opposition. How can you tackle this whole thing? And what would you like to do about European issues? And I know it's a huge question, but maybe just to pick some ideas, what, what can be done within the country? Probably uh, we would need a two-week seminar to, to discuss uh, the, the, the road for the Hungarian opposition. All I can say is that, that we still think that the fight is not hopeless, and even if it were, we would fight because we can't do it otherwise. That's the only way for us. For what is going to happen in the next couple of months, yes, probably at one level there will be this buy the book, let's stick off the boxes and, and check what is being delivered and what not. And I have to say again, as a matter of recognition, that, that these 27 plus three conditionalities or super milestones that the commission has defined, they really touch the heart of lots of matters, not all of them, but many. And they certainly reflect a deep knowledge of the situation that I personally wouldn't have expected, to be honest. You asked about the roller coaster ride that, that we had over the last couple of years. It's funny, with, with the benefit of, of hindsight, looking back on so, some of the sentences that the Commission has said, again, because we never... Also, maybe some of the sentences that Petri Sarvamaya said in Parliament for the EPP group, where I was, wasn't really sure what he, he means. These sentences do change their meaning or they get into a different light. For example, at the State of the Union address when... Ursula von der Leyen said to Parliament, rest assured, I will protect the budget. I wasn't sure she meant it. But after the three decisions in, in, in December, I can say she probably did, and, and we have to recognize that. But you mentioned the argument or, or the, the example of the Erasmus thing and the, and the university boards. This is a perfect example of what we must be prepared for in the next couple of months, and, and what we must... And, and also, it's, it's a perfect example of what this peacock dance actually means. I, probably in many of your country, uh, countries, peacocks don't even exist, but, you know, the, the peacocks, they dance laterally. They take a couple of, of steps left, and they go to the right. A little bit like Hungarian chardash, by the way. And in this particular case, for those who don't know it, the problem, of the, the problem with these, these boards that currently oversee, I think, 95% of, of Hungarian national universities, not the private ones, but the state-owned universities, is that, on the one hand, they are stuffed with Fidesz politicians who have been elected for life without any public consultation, just at the whim of the prime minister. These bodies control the entire assets of the universities, which might be okay, but the third thing is that they also control academic life. They decide practically about which professor is, uh, will be the, the director, and they decide about who gets the money for research. Academic freedom in Hungary does not exist. So you can take this as an exercise to tick off boxes, and check whether there are ministers or uh, state secretaries or merely deputy state secretaries allowed in these boards. But the real problem is that the way these boards have been put together is absolutely not transparent. The guys are still appointed for life. They still all come from a particular political camp. And they have decisions to make that in no democratic country would be taken by anybody else than the Senate of the universities. So the question is whether during the next three or six months the European Commission is going to go to the line and demand nothing less than the restoration of academic freedom. Or will you be satisfied, will we be satisfied with uh, getting a couple of ministers out of these, these, these boards. This is the sort of fight that we have to lead. This is the sort of fight that we have to lead for the independence of justice, and it's, it's exactly the same thing on the public procurement front. And that's, again, the reason why I'm saying that at the end of the day, this is not 
an administrative fight. This is a political issue. On the one hand, because I'm quite sure that Orban wants Putin to win. As simple as that. And this guy is sitting at the European Council table and influencing the decisions of the European Union and blocking every type of aid to the Ukraine. The real thing is to tackle that problem. Uh, the, the real question is whether the European Union will finally discover its strength or whether it will be afraid of itself and not use the final consequence on the matters that, that are on the table. Thank you. I saw, Catherine, you had a question. I don't know whether we can give a microphone. Oh, sure, you have it already. Super. So I give you the floor. Thank you very much for this welcome and thorough debate. I wanted to uh, raise a um, number of issues. First, the media. We're all aware, I think, of the frailty of the media sector. We had a debate with uh, Mrs. Uh, Delbos some time ago on that uh, issue. And it's a pity that this is not part of the conditions that uh, were mentioned. Another remark I wanted to make is the knife has been available for a while. I'm looking back to my professional, previous professional experience, and we had a directive on criminal protection of financial interests. We had a body that was called Olaf, but somehow we were not convinced that they would help, I suppose. So it's, it's very good news that, well, it's a sad news that we have come to the point when we cannot escape activation, but it's also good news to know that protection of financial interests has been there for a long time, and it's pretty useful, I believe, from what I hear, from what I hear you saying. I had a question, perhaps, for the lady from the cabinet, uh, Mrs. Yorva, I'm sorry for forget the name. It's a fairly technical issue, but currently, where does the burden of proof lie? I mean, the current conditionality mechanism. Is it for the investigating bodies? Or is it for, what's the balance, perhaps it's hard to tell, or does the country concerned have to prove that it is not misusing EU fund, which I find a very minimal, I mean, I'm, I'm completely convinced that we should uh, go back, but technically, also I don't know, because I'm getting contradictory information, without next generation EU is concern or impacted by conditionality, the conditionality me mechanism. It would be very good to know if we're just dealing cohesion funds. I was at the time of uh, enlargement involved in, in campaigning for audit structures. So it's, it's an old thing. But I don't know where we are today because uh, the landscape, the financial landscape, of course, has changed. And finally, I, I did a little bit of my homework recently, a lot of homework, because this is technical. And uh, looking at conditionality, primacy of uh, European law, but mainly I focused on another country, not Hungary. And I don't know where we stand. I'm, of course, thinking I have a limited capacity of understanding of work, but I was looking at Poland, perhaps even more complicated, but where do we stand as regards Poland? Thank you very much. There was one question here in the front. My first question would go to Ms. Constantina, and the question is regarding the milestones on the Hungarian judiciary. In the milestones, you said that the Commission will check this based on Article 19, and Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. My question would be, does that mean that you will check the delivery also against the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union, where in recent years there has been many nice things that they said how independent the judiciary should look like. And also in this regard, also the case law of the court says that basically Article 19 is the expression of Article 2 and the rule of law and so on and so forth. So in this regard, do you see any, like if further steps needs to be taken? Because maybe the government will not do what it's supposed to do. In that regard, do you see a possibility for a commission to launch infringement? on the independence of judiciary in Hungary, and also, I know it's a long question, but also in view of uh, the principle of non-regression, which has been recently said by the Court of Justice in the case of Republica, would you consider doing something along those lines? And Ms. Delbos-Corfield, to you, 
should this happen that the gov government will fail in fulfilling the super milestones, do you think that the approach of the council would change in terms of actually going for the recommendations and so on and so forth? Thank you. Maybe Florian, you had a question and then afterwards I give you the floor because three enough. Thank you. I have one question concerning also the implementation of the conditional me mechanism because there is, I think, one clause saying that not the beneficiary should suffer but only the member state concerned, meaning that the member state then replaces the stopped money from its own budget so that the beneficiaries like cities or so. So we have several cities, I think, which are not governed by the by the FIDESH or whatever party so that they can still receive money or should receive like the, the structural funds or so. So how is this or is this already implemented or is this already under discussion how it will be implemented? Thanks. So, Ms. Konstantin, I give you the floor. You've got a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to go one by one. Thank you very much for the question. On your question, so the first point was, you know, how does the conditionality mechanism work in terms of the, the burden of proof? I mean, of course, we don't expect member states to come regularly to the Commission and show us evidence that they are good people. <laughs> we on the Commission are actively monitoring everybody and you know we talked a lot about Hungary today although it's not in the title of the debate but unavoidably uh, this mechanism was triggered uh, against them but under this regulation all the member states are, are monitored uh, we are receiving complaints there are evaluation reports so that's you know a, a constant work ongoing the first burden of proof it's on us because we bring you know the case we launch it we we open it we, we have the money. The money, it's, no, we, we don't have the money. It's not the Commission having the money. It's the EU budget. It's the money of the people, I would say, and it's on us to protect them. So, yes, we have the burden of, of proof uh, in making a, a strong case, putting it forward, because we have to produce this Commission assessment, which is at the basis of launching a proposal for, for the Council. And then the burden will be on the concerned member states to show that they have remedied the situation. Huh? Maybe I move to the next one. Well, everything that's in the EU budget, it's, it's protected and it will be monitored for, for conditionality. So all the money. So uh, unless I'm wrong, I think that that should be also because it's part of the MFF, the next generation EU money, if, <laughs> if you can confirm. So I would say, yes, theoretically, that's, that's protected. Then you had a question on Poland. Where do we stand? Okay, you saw we haven't activated this tool for, for Poland, and here we come back to the point both myself and Madame Del Bos made. It's a budgetary tool. You really have to prove there is a direct impact on the budget, right? For Poland, we have big rule of law issues, but we have used other tools, you know, specifically on the judiciary. While on the contrary, for Hungary, the aspects regarding judicial independence, they are not captured by the budget conditionality. We have put them at milestones in another tool in the recovery plan. So if we expect the member states and everyone to work by the rule of law, we also need to do the same and you know, work within the legal framework of, of each tool. Where we stand with Poland you know, more broadly on, on rule of law, I mean, we have an ongoing Article 7 open, we have infringements there, and I think now we are waiting to see whether they will fulfill their own milestones on judiciary in the recovery and resilience plan. You might be aware of the ongoing discussions, well, process in, in Poland because they have passed a law, the parliament has passed a law with the aim to meet the milestones on judiciary. It's been uh, challenged at the Constitutional Tribunal by President Duda, so we are waiting to see the final outcome of the law to assess it and, and to see where, where that leads us. But I think, again, you know, we have all the other tools activated for Poland, and we achieved some progress with infringements, but they also take a long time. Now we should see some progress with the RRP if indeed the, the law will meet the, the standards, but we still have quite a big chantier in front of us. Um, also because the, the changes there in the judiciary, they have been 
you know, really, really huge and quite a worrying situation. Um, <clears throat> milestones on judiciary for Hungary in their own RRP. Yes, they will be checked against Article 19, and absolutely we have interpretation and judgments from, from ECJ on how should Article 19 be interpreted. So that's about ensuring that you have on the ground effective judicial protection. It's basically about independent courts, huh? because if you don't have independent courts, then you cannot ensure effective judicial protection. So absolutely, I think that will be the lens that uh, we will look at. Will we launch infringements against Hungary on judiciary? Maybe at some point, if there will be a case, we will make it. For now, I hope we will see some remedial action based on these milestones huh, that we have put there, which would be quite, quite significant. Impact on the final beneficiaries, I, I had a question there. Look, and maybe I will t take them, them a minute to explain also linked to the, to the Erasmus, because, you know, there were questions, oh, why is this happening? Because, you know, then it should have been for Hungary to ensure uh, money from their own uh, budget. The issue there is that, so Erasmus, it's a directly managed program. The way it works is, you know, is the EU money, being given and to give the money you have to sign a contract and in the council decision of december on the conditionality mechanism there is a ban to basically sign contracts with such public interest trusts uh, which are managing the universities so that's the issue that you know it cannot be that the hungarian government would put money for the erasmus programs because there's a, a certain management of the programs but under the conditionality regulation as such, indeed, you are right. For example, for cohesion funds, which is shared management, the way it works is that you approve the programs, the member state will put the money, and then they are sending claims to be reimbursed. And if the funds are suspended, indeed, there's an obligation for the member state that they would put anyway from their own budget uh, money to ensure that the projects are, are running, basically. So there is protection in, in the regulation, but I had to explain a bit this difference with the, the Erasmus, the directly managed funds and this prohibition to sign contracts. Because I, I'm not sure I will have the opportunity to have the microphone for another round. We are quite late. As I said, unavoidably, you know, we talked a lot about Hungary today, but also Madame Del Bos, you know, she gave the example of France. And indeed, especially with this annual rule of law report, I think it's clear that there is no perfect rule of law system. It was, I think, also a discovery for several of our member states with, you know, long-standing democracies, with rather good rule of law standards. On some aspects, it was also a discovery for themselves to, to see that, oh, actually, we have been a bit, you know, having just some customary approach, and maybe we had good politicians over the years, but indeed, maybe it's not the best system. So there are a lot of reflections in member states on, for example, having an independent national council for the judiciary, because they didn't have such a body. So all these kind of reforms and changes. So that's really the preventive side, which we have to work with, because we see that when we get in situations of really severe, you know, backsliding on rule of law, it's more difficult to roll it back. Huh? So I think we have to put all our strengths and indeed not, not believe that, oh, it can happen only in some member states. And everybody, you know, we need this awareness and the next step will be to move with the level of awareness of the importance of rule of law really to to everybody, you know, people should have at some point discussions over dinner. And I'm not exaggerating, but we need to get to the point of making everybody aware that if the judiciary is not functioning, it, it will have at some point a real impact on your, on your life. I think there's still a bit of untapped potential in the role that the business environment businesses can have. I'm not naive. I don't expect the business people to have their first objective defense of the rule of law. Of course, they are economic actors. They take their decisions based on this. But I think we can still work with them to be more vocal because ultimately, if we have rule of law issues in member states, it's not only affecting uh, the area of uh, free movement of the judiciary. Huh? 
it's, it's really our internal market that is uh, at stake in the long term. And they, again, here I think we, we can work more closely with them to, to be more, more vocal in terms of, of this awareness raising. Yeah. And maybe on this last point, I think this rule of law mechanism, I hope what it will achieve, it's also a bit of a deterrent effect. You know, it is a real tool. We see it, it was activated now. So I hope that, you know, as you say, lessons learned, also other member states will look at it and they will already start to do some cleaning up of, of their internal courtyard, not to get into a situation of, you know, such a mechanism being activated. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Madame Labaskov. Yeah, I will address the, the question also on cities because I also wanted to, to talk about that. This is also, of course, one of the defects of this tool is uh, that it is preventing money to go to the beneficiaries. In the case of, of Hungary, I think we were, we were feeling less guilty because we knew that anyway the money in the end didn't get to the beneficiaries most of the time, which once again is not the same in Poland, which is also one of the reasons it's much more difficult to use it for Poland. And so also all of the debates we are having, rule of law will be functioning and tools will be functioning in a European Union of course, but I think in a federalist uh, day, I, uh, this is obvious to everyone, of course, with no more unanimity, and not only the real unanimity that's on the paper that we should get rid of, but the famous ones that they're using all the time, because in fact, they never can take a decision without unanimity, even if, if it's things that are clearly not unanimity competences in the text. So there's the unanimity, but there's really the participatory direct Europe. I mean, rule of law will not function without ever. The definition of rule of law of the Commission today, with its four pillars, anti-corruption, media pluralism, independence of justice and democracy, what, what democracy is today for Commission is what could today even be fake democracy like we have it in Hungary, is existing elections. But where are the counterpowers? Where are the cities that can be counterpowers? The territories that can be counterpowers? The stakeholders that can be counterpowers? So this is really one of the huge work that we need to do to get them more involved. On this, I really want to say that Greens are very alone. The renew a bit, social democrats, for example, are still big believers of representative democracy. And I think that European Union with only representative democracy in the next years will not make us able of activating all of the counters powers we have everywhere in NGOs and in the citizens. So we really need to step up on this. And we need indeed to be more inventive on the city, on how to get the money directly to those that need it. And creative doesn't mean saying it, because there's a lot of people that have been saying for a number of years, no problem, we can do, we can activate the conditionality mechanism and we will give the money directly to the cities. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that we can't do it, but for the moment we are promising something that nobody has really worked on and nobody is really managing to give a few tools concrete tools that exist. And we're asking the Commission to do something that doesn't exist. I, I've even had a colleague telling me, you know, the Commission could do it. I mean, you know, the Commission could, of course, take the money, decide what NGOs can do it, and all this. Do you know how many people in Norway are working to give the famous funds that Norway are supposed to give? I mean, it's, it's a tremendous job. So we don't have the effective tools today. One of the routes, and I think it's interesting that you talked about the recovery funds, are to invent, in fact, through these funds, like recovery funds that we programs with conditionality. There were the green conditionalities. There was a number of specific rule of law conditionality, in fact, also in the recovery funds, how in the way we invented them. And there was this special envelope going directly to, to the cities. And this is, in fact, today uh, one of the rare things that is helping Budapest in the, in the awful situation it is in, but is also helping Warsaw and helping Prague and a number of other cities because there's this money going directly to the cities. So I think that there we have little things that we can do and we're not using enough. On the question of the council, of course, I didn't take the time to specifically state it, but the big, you'd, you stated it very well, uh, the big weak, pers uh, weak uh, structure in all of this institution is the council, and it is still very, very weak. 
And so, no, I don't have that most hope on the Council for the future. We are, of course, very dependent on the political situation, so the mood changed with Italy and Sweden last political situation. These were people, these were permits I had around the table to be proactive. Italy a bit less, but Sweden was clearly one of the proactive ones. And we need this for your four fifth med votes for recommendation. I was on the border of having these four four fifth votes for the recommendation six months ago, but we don't have it anymore. So we depend on that. We depend on the fact that they want to act and do things. So this is the big weakness we need recommendation. I really believe, I mean, I understand, I'm not a legalistic myself, but what I understand is that we are not all clear on the interpretation of Article 7, but I understand that we need to close Article 7.2. Uh, one, anyway, if we wanted to go to Article 7.2, which is a bit of a utopia because the day member states will decide that they take out withdraw voting sanction from another country is, is not yet there. But anyway, today we don't even manage to finish to close the number one, the point number one. I think these recommendations are very important. I have always thought it because I think first it's making us use the famous tool. So in a long-term perspective, it is important. It's important because I think these recommendations will make a new pressure and a new step in the Hungarian situation, like the interim report in Parliament did in September. We had the Sargentini report and the interim report brought a new step, and the fact that there was an overwhelming majority in Parliament helped. So if we had a good recommendation from the Council, it's a new thing. That means that Orban is never in an easy situation. But we also need recommendation, and I really insist on that. I was telling you a bit earlier, my colleagues a bit earlier, I think we really need recommendation, because this problem of second state already created in Hungary, which means that even if tomorrow the oppos democratic opposition managed to win is going to be di very difficult because of all these places that have gone to public trust. And it's not only the academy, the university. Because of all of these people who have seen their mandate, all of these so-called independent authorities, of all of the independent authorities' chairs that have seen their mandate, suddenly becoming nine years or they were changed, just before the election, in case. Uh, so we, all, we have all of these pe second, pe second state already there that will be very difficult to, to take down if the democratic opposition came in and would mean also that the money still is channeled to the urban people because they are the one in, in all of these trusts in the boards and all this. That would mean, and I know it was a very big debate in the opposition in the months before the election and there were two views, what do we do once we elected? I would be on the side of those. I think you should go quickly and you should fire some of these people. But for this to be not then immediately opposed by the, the open parliament and the commission and all this, the recommendation will help to say we're not inventing the problem. We have all these texts that you all agreed on in the European Union saying the situation is really bad, so it's normal that we are getting rid of people that were not put them there in a democratic and legitimate, legitimate situation. So I really think that this is an important step in Council, but it's not because it's an important step that it's there. So I'm very worried about council. I would just want to add something. It's about, you know, that we are talking about treaty changes. You know that in the party, I guess you talked about it this morning with, with Sandro and, and Dominic. We are talking about working on the proposal, the, what would be the parliament proposal for treaty changes. I was very much involved in, in the Libe aspects. And I really think that one of the things we would need, I think that Article 7 is a tool that was not used efficiently and, and you should not always criticize a tool that you didn't use. But that being said, there are some limits. And I do think that, for example, there should be a few automatic symbolic sanctions and, uh, because money is not everything. And one of them is that if you've been under Article 7, let's say for a complete term, five years, you should not be able of having a presidency. I am so 
amazed by the fact that nobody is taking the measure of what it is going to be to have a Hungarian presidency. And once again, a council presidency is not the end of the world, but it does have a few powers, notably on the agenda. And we are coming to this Hungarian presidency. And so everyone is telling me, oh, it's the less in interesting presidency of all. It's, it's really the six months that we can sacrifice. Okay, so what are we supposed to do during these six months? We, we all just do something else, go to holidays? I just don't get it. And I don't get it that that has not been foreseen, that we have a few symbolic things that are important, and it's not only about money. So I think that on this, we should also, for the long term, change things. I had a very last, last thing that I wanted to say. You should always tell everyone now, and that's something I'm really telling in France a lot today, this is why in the report it was so good that we got these words about the hybrid, how Hungary was now in an hybrid situation and an hybrid autocracy. And, it, and it's the words that made the most noise. Because today, democracy don't die with, with tanks in the streets. I mean, we have the Russian aggression in, in Ukraine, but most of the time what is happening today is not that. It's not these tanks and it's not military on the television saying today we, it is this very intelligent and clever putting play people in a very smooth way, killing the democracy with the, with the help of, of propaganda, with the disinformation. We have today a country where I'm very concerned it is Greece. In Greece we have a journalist that was killed. They are very in a very voluntary way not investigating it. I have had meetings with journalists who don't want their names to be given. I have had discussion with Transparency International where they don't want to give you their names. You know, you go in Hungary and those journalists that still are there and Transparency International, you know the faces. These people, they, they have gone beyond fair. They are there and they're doing their job. In Greece, it's the first time that I have met people that have told me, I don't want you to put my name anyway. Please, please, just don't say my name. And we're letting this happen again because we're just forgetting that democracies don't die in a violent way today. They, they die in a very slow way. Thank you so much. Say a final word? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I promise I'll try to be short for real. I'd like to say two things. Uh, one on this burden of proof issue and maybe something on the money as well. The burden of proof varies um, based on the situation. For example, in the structure of funds, it is the beneficiary country that has to prove to the European Union that your system is watertight and it works. Uh, unfortunately, in the past, it, it has probably happened too often that uh, the Commission hasn't really pinned down the Hungarian authorities to their obligation to comply with the rules. As I said, very interestingly, the current situation that we have is not so difficult for Orban because of the rule of law conditionality mechanism, but because the Commission has started to apply other instruments that it has. The Charter of Fundamental Rights is a horizontal conditionality and then as the RRF regulation and the semester. And in other areas, there are also tools like this. Speaking of media freedom, just that there is one thing where we also uh, can address Commissioner uh, Vice President Jourova. We know that in Hungary, currently, there are like 400 uh, media outlets, you probably know it better than me, which are in the hands of a single right-wing government-sponsored, what, what do you call it, conglomerate. These are pursuing a propaganda that puts Soviet-era propaganda to shame. I'm quite sure that it is against all sorts of internal market rules that you could imagine. Nothing happens for years. Things like this should be discovered by the Commission. I really don't want to, to end this day by criticizing because I think the Commission has done a tremendous job over the last half year. They have earned our trust. I really hope that the Golem has now awakened. And definitely, if nothing else happens than these 27 super milestones and the plus three, which are connected to the structural funds, if they are pursued to the re real end, then there will be a different situation in half a year's time or in a year's time. I'm not so optimistic about the money. I do think there would be a technical solution. I have spent half my life working with European funds. I would say indirect management would be the solution. 
the same solution as the European Union is using in the pre-accession funds on the Western Balkans. You could do the same in Hungary. Of course, we don't have the legal basis to do that, but we have a commission to propose. We have Parliament and the Council to approve. It would be possible. It would be a big change. Impossible is nothing. We are in a, in a fight, and we can do it. So let's end on this optimistic note. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just can approve Ms. Konstantin's remark that we need to talk about it. We need to raise awareness. We need to discover our knives in the, in the drawer and take them out and cut the apple. And I really thanks a lot. And I'm sorry for those who wanted to ask a question and we had no time, but you have to hurry away and we'll continue this discussion. Thank you so much.